Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful to the organizing committee for inviting me to this beautiful venue in Dublin's fair city. Um, as I say, I'm Dr. Taylor from Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. Now, this is similar to the talk I gave last year in Birmingham at the APPM, so if you've attended that, you probably can fall asleep after your lunch. For the rest of you, pay attention. We have been continually bombarded by the media uh, reports of dilemmas that occur when parents meet the obstacle of the intensive care unit um, and the child's very often in the middle of that dilemma. So the difference between last year's and this year's slide is the Charlie Guard and his parents, but you can see on the slide. So ethics hasn't changed for several millennia, certainly back to Greek philosophy, but the context of the ethical dilemma seemed to change on a daily or certainly weekly basis. Parents now seem to have a lot of power, certainly if you're to read the UK courts and the UK media, um, almost every case where there's a falling out, perhaps, between our lack of communication between the parents and the caregivers, it leads almost straight to the Daily Mail and the other broadcast media. And this latest one is little Isaiah, who's in King's College Hospital, London, and he's undergoing a preliminary court appearances, or his parents are. And if everything's to be believed that you read in the papers, his father has been banned from visiting the hospital. So this is another dilemma that's going to be played out in the courts for our attention or our money. But over the years, there have been continual bombardment of cases. Little Nicola McCormick shared the image of her five-year-old Josser in a bit to highlight his pain and suffering as he battles malignant brain tumor. And that argument, if you remember, was um, should he be moved to palliative care or to get palliative chemotherapy? And the judge, the judges in most of these cases seem to side with the doctors or with the caregivers. And that's because the courts really are based on logic. And if the caregivers, the consultants, the doctors come to court with a documentation in a logical manner of the risks and benefits of treatment to the patient, the courts follow the logic of that presentation. The parents tend to go to court to argue love, they love their child. And unfortunately, whether you like it or not, the UK courts are adversarial and love isn't really logical. Those of you who have suffered a broken heart will understand what I mean by love not being exactly logical. Um, BBNB was a judgment given a few years ago in 2006 that has come back to bite us in Belfast a few times, and that was a child with severe type 1 SMA, a condition where the child usually dies before the first birthday. And in Belfast, we had a similar case a few years ago where the parents wanted a tracheostomy. Uh, one of the respiratory physicians was opposed to starting that line of treatment in a child who could be given adequate or perfect palliative care without tracheostomy and home ventilation. He brought the case to the Clinical Ethics Committee, which I sat on in the Belfast Trust, and in the month it took him to bring the case and argue it through and get his papers together, there was a social media campaign that ran against him personally in the local community on Facebook and social media. And by the time he got to the Ethics Committee, he more or less has, had withdrawn his objection and the child got the tracheostomy. And those children now, there's five of them in Belfast getting um, intrathecal drug to hopefully extend the life of SMA. Even though in the trial they've gone past the point at which that drug could be successful. So the ethicists have written a balanced view of these cases. Uh, here's just a summary. You won't see the numbers in the back, but it's B 
basically going back to the 1960s, and it shows two columns about the numbers of published articles on neuromuscular disease and on the small orange bars, those in respiratory failure over the past decades. So almost decade by decade, there's a logarithmic increase in the number of research papers and reviews of neuromuscular diseases and respiratory failure. Patient numbers haven't increased. They've probably gone down with modern diagnostic techniques, but the number of atten the attention being brought to that by clinicians has multiplied. Making decisions, um, the Archives of Disease in Children published the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health guidance on decision making at the end of life. And that, those guidelines are very helpful. They talk about several categories. Uh, one where life is limited in quantity, one where life is limited in quant quality, and one where there's an informed competent refusal of treatment in the adolescent or the older child. Such as Hannah Jones, happened a few years ago. I read the book. It's available at all good bookstores and on Kindle. Hannah Jones was a 12-year-old girl with a severe cardiomyopathy. She'd been treated in the Birmingham Children's Hospital, and they were managing her cardiomyopathy medically. But she has been referred to Great Ormond Street for a heart transplant. She refused to undergo a heart transplant. She's 12 years old. So what do you think? Can a 12-year-old refuse a treatment that the parents sign the consent form? Actually, this is meant to be interactive. I know it's a big audience at the back, but shout out your views. Who thinks that we should allow a 12-year-old to consent? Let's start with the easy one. Should a 12-year-old consent to medical treatment? Be included. Should a child consent against the wishes or against the knowledge of her parents? Well, let's think about the Victoria Gillick case, where GPs were being authorised by the local health authority to prescribe the contraceptive pill to girls under the age of 16, and that's the whole basis of the Gillick judgment. Isn't that right? So, Victoria Gillick challenged that, lost, went to appeal where she won the case. In fact, the Court of Appeal said that children under the age of 16 could not consent to medical treatment without the knowledge of their patient, parents. So it then went to the House of Lords and they ruled by a split vote. There's five law lords, three to two. That's how close the Gillick judgment is. And they ruled that, yes, doctors could take the consent of children under the age of 16 without the knowledge of the parents. So it's not just about consent, it's also about confidentiality. And of course, with the contraceptive pill, it means that if you told the parents, then all would be lost. So confidentiality is an important part of Gillick, not just the issue of consent. So I ask again, can a child under the age of 16 consent to medical treatment? Clearly, yes, the law allows it. And what's the crucial factor that you must determine when you consent your adolescent? The, the, test, the Fraser rules that they have sufficient maturity to understand the risks and benefits of the treatment or diagnosis. In America, they call it the mature minor. And there's certain tests of a, being a mature minor. One is to have a child under the age of 16 that makes you mature. <laughs> I'll stop there before we get into another debate. <laughs> okay, so can a child of under... So that's accepted. Does, do they, does everybody accept that? So Hannah Jones at 12 can consent to medical... Can re, so could Hannah Jones consent to medical treatment without her parents. You happy enough now? There was some disagreement when I first made that point. So next point, can Hannah Jones refuse medical treatment if her parents sign the consent form? Depends, okay. So she's gonna die without a heart transplant. 
With a heart transplant, she has a good chance of survival, but there's lifelong chemotherapy and anti-rejection and tests, which she knows all about. She's a very, very clever girl. She's been in hospital most of her life. Read the book. It's very good. Her mum turns out to be an intensive care unit nurse. Yes, they are the bane of my life. <laughs> As I say, they keep me in bed at night, professionally speaking. <laughs> professionally speaking. So a good intensive care nurse is worth her weight in gold. Her mother co-authors the book, Hannah's Choice, it's called. And if you're interested in adolescent consent and adolescent matters, it's an interesting read. It's all about ponies and sisterly love and mummies and daddies and girls' relationships. Boys, don't read it. <laughs> um, so she, the parents didn't sign her consent form. It didn't go to court. This was resolved in the family. And it didn't go all the way to the court. She was allowed to refuse by her parents, even though the consequences of that was that she would die prematurely without getting a transplant. So in the book, it explains that a, a GP locum came into their area in England, and he looked into the case, and he called child protection, and he started making a big fuss about this was wrong. She should be forced to have a cardiac transplant. So you can read about it in the book. I'll not spoiler alert. I'll not spoil it for you. A year later, she had a heart transplant. She's a girl. She's a teenage. Sorry, I'm not allowed to say that anymore. She's a teenager. Is that better? I, hang on a minute. I've got two of each. I've got two boys and two girls. In a randomized controlled trial, <laughs> girls are more mature than boys. They can make a decision much, much earlier than boys can. The knuckle dragger, teenage. So girls can, especially a child who's been in and out of hospital knows exactly which vein you want to use, which vein you don't want to use. I want the mask. So we know that children who are attending hospital regularly um, are very competent to make decisions for themselves. Precocious adolescence. So we know, you all know, you know all this. I'm not going to teach you anything different today except one little thing I hope at the end I will give you to take home. The modern principles are autonomy. Beneficence means best interests are doing good. Non-maleficence avoiding harm and justice is fairness. So these are all equal. And yet, by Beecham and Childress, the Georgetown mantra as it's known, they've written the book that we all follow on medical ethics. Autonomy, they, they initiated, they talked about these principles as being equal, none being prima facie. And yet, in the era that we're living now, in 2017, autonomy appears to trump every other um, ethical principle. Children under the age of X clearly do not possess autonomy. So therefore, we look to the parents to give an act with autonomy for them. And the Children Act, UK, Children Order, Northern Ireland, 2004, allows us to look at the circumstances of who has parental responsibility and can give consent to a child. Tony Blair, in his goodness, took us into the Human Rights Act in 2001 in the UK, and that again sets out certain articles, and Ireland has not signed up to the Human Rights Act, but follows the Human Rights and the European Court of Justice. So I don't think you can read those. Let me read them to you. Article 2, Right to Protection of Life. Article 3, Prohibition of Torture, Inhuman and Degrading Treatment. There's a whole list of other ones. There's no Article 13. Article 4 is Prohibition of Slavery. When the, law, when the Act came out in the UK, a group of junior doctors took their local health authority to court saying that by being on call, they were being enslaved. They lost. <laughs> Don't try it. Don't try it. 
So I'll give you Article 2 and Article 3. So protection of life versus prohibition of torture and human and degrading treatment. Only one of these rights is absolute. Okay, I've narrowed it down. You've got a choice of two. So all the, all the others can be argued about, but only Article 2, Article 3, the choice, only one is absolute in the European Court of Justice. Is it the right to life? Put up your hands. There's a protection of the right to life. Well, if I'm standing here with a Kalashnikov aimed at this audience and a Garda marksman has a laser dot on my head, do I have the right to life? No, under the Prevention of Terrorism Law, he's going to shoot the bullet into my head to protect yourself. So there is no absolute right to protect life in the European Court of Justice. It's got other laws that put it in perspective. Prohibition of torture, inhuman and degrading treatment is an absolute right according to the European courts. So that is used, that's the basis of palliative care from a human rights aspect, not from the usual palliation aspect. So we have a duty, an absolute right to perfect, to avoid torture, inhuman and degrading treatment with our patients, but not necessarily to protect their life. So I'm going to do a very unusual thing right now, being an Irishman, I'm going to shut up. Being an Ulsterman, it's even stranger. I want you to talk to the person beside you for two minutes, and I want to talk about you to talk about your moral values. Let's think of it as what you would put on your dating website. <laughs> Keep it clean. <laughs> and where you got those values from. Let's call them virtues. Where you get them from and what they mean to you. Okay. Well, it doesn't take much to get an Irish audience going. I recognize that you guys are experts. I'm not here with any expertise. I'm just voicing what, and being a conduit for talk, you guys to do what you do every day. This is your job. Okay, so give me some answers. Tell me something good about yourselves. Respect. Respect. Respect for others. Respect for yourself. Good. Honesty. Honesty num one of the top five that came from a report, not that I would know, on dating websites. <laughs> Women <laughs> apparently rate honesty uh, very highly in a man. I have no specialist knowledge of that. Being non judgmental. Are you a nurse? Seriously? I'm, I'm joking. Do you want to come and work in Belfast? <laughs> okay. Helping others, doing good. Here's the problem, in this audience, we're pretty homogeneous, we're pretty well the same. We're not really a big picture of the society that we live in and that we work in. So if, if you were to go into a different, probably your clinic or your ward, and ask the same question, you might get different variation. In that little co short conversation that you had, did you find out anything else about the person you were talking to? Did they have exactly the same moral values as you did? I suspect pretty similar, but we're all different. And the great news is, no matter how smart Elon Musk and AI become, artificial intelligence, in the next decade, machines will never take over the job of doctors and nurses. There's a prediction for you. Why do I say that? Because no matter how smart the smartest computer will ever be, it will never be able to deal with the variation of the human condition. Look at the patients, the parents, the children you've worked with. Are any of them the same? They may have the same diagnosis, maybe Down syndrome or whatever, but are, are they the same? No, so no robot will ever be able to work that out. The human brain 
the doctors, the nurses, the clinicians, the counsellors, the psychologists will always be needed. There's my prediction for the future as I cl close in on retirement. So we're all different. So that's a very important, that, that little exercise I gave, it wasn't just fun, although I hope it was. The idea was that you look to yourself, you've got moral values, where did you get them from? Mommy, your mommy. My mommy taught me never to tell a lie <laughs> because she had a wet dishcloth. <laughs> and you got it around the back of your legs. Never happened to me. The threat was enough, but there was no child protection in those days. <laughs> and she was a lovely mother. So yes, we get our values from our upbringing, from our parents, from our mother and society, the newspapers we read, the fake news stories we tend, hopefully, ignore. So this is again another worry. We are being bombarded, as I said earlier, by media. We become engaged by that. We take on some of the values that we read about in the literature that we choose to read. That's a worry with the rise of Trump. And what we're seeing in certain media outlets and Facebook. And Facebook have acknowledged that there's been fake news around. It can sway elections. It sways the way we think, the way we value immigration and other things. So be careful to keep your values. However, we must practice our job, our professional job, whether it's nursing, psychology, medicine, ethically. Now, morals and ethics actually mean the same thing. One's Greek, one's Latin. But morals really seem to make, talk about what your values are. Ethics is about how you treat your patient. So although you've got your own moral values, you, rec you must recognize that other people have different values. Whether they're different cultures, religions, Jehovah's Witness will have different values on the need for blood and blood products than you may have or than I may have. So how do we practice our specialty, our work, acknowledging that those people have different values? Charlie Gard's parents had clearly different values than the clinicians looking after Charlie Gard. How would you define an ethical dilemma? There's a dilemma. I define an ethical dilemma as being when you have a different moral stance than your patient or the parents of your patient. And what I have to keep reminding the junior anaesthetist coming through our hospital every three months is to go and talk to the child primarily because the child is your patient. The parents are important, of course. It's a child in the context of a loving family. But remember to talk to the child. And I don't know, many times I've had to tell parents in the PICU, usually around the end of life care, that their child is my patient. And they are not my patient. They are the parents of my patient. So we must respect the morals of others. And we must work in the context that we have our values. We must go home at night with our and values intact. But we must also practice medicine and nursing and psychology and physiother physiotherapy and other specialties by respecting their values just as much. Easy to say, harder to do. To, be a, to have autonomy, and the parents again will act um, with the autonomy for the child, they have to determine competence which is the key part of the Gillick, the adolescent and the pre-adolescent, is determining if that patient's competent to make the choice between the treatment or the diagnosis and balance the risks against the choice. Disclosure means we must give all information. Do you give patients and parents all the information available or just the bits they need to know? Well, certainly in UK, it's been for decades, that we only give them what is materially important. In America, it's full disclosure. It's been for a number of years 
full disclosure. I work in Canada, and it's about full disclosure. The risk of full disclosure, we would say, is that we may put patients off a beneficial treatment, and therefore they won't take the treatment. So we are becoming a society where we have to give full disclosure. Example, a friend of mine's cardiologist, a solicitor came in to have a stent put in his coronary artery. He was making too much money and eating too much carbohydrate. So he got coronary artery disease. She warned him on her consent form the risks of having a coronary artery stent, occlusion, thrombosis, death. He had a stent, he survived. He wrote a letter of complaint to the trust saying that he was made unnecessarily anxious by the D word. <laughs> Welcome to Belfast. Voluntariness means there should be no coercion. Here's a fiver, sign the consent form. Be careful in research. And understanding means that they have to understand in the language that you use. So we get interpreters for learning disability, we have to present the information, how they can understand it. Is understanding different than competence? Yes. So I can be Polish, I am competent, but I don't understand a word you're saying. So there's a difference between understanding and competence. This is the Anthony Bland case. He was a Liverpool supporting who got suffocated during the Hillsborough Stadium disaster and he was left persistent vegetative state. 17 years after the, his suffocation, his brain injury, he was being fed by nasogastric tubes. So this is a key landmark decision for palliative care because the law lords ruled that Anthony Bland should have his nasogastric tube removed and we weren't depriving him of hydration and nutrition. We were removing a medical treatment that wasn't in his best interests. So he, the law lord, Lord Keith, argued that it wasn't in his best interests to have artificial hydration and, and nutrition. Now, a number of years ago, I sat on the GMC guidelines looking at withdrawing and withholding care, the latest guidelines from the GMC, and we had many arguments uh, in London when we were writing the document over what AN, uh, artificial hydration and nutrition, meant and those of us from the pediatric world said, hang on a minute, children who grow up with an NG tube or a PEG tube don't regard that as being artificial means. To them, that is the way they get their hydration and the way they get their nutrition. So removing that isn't the same as taking an NG tube out of a person with dementia, multiple strokes and multiple other problems, where it's clearly seen as an artificial treatment. So the arguments about end-of-life care and removal of palliative hydration or nutrition still rage, and it's still one of the main types of case that comes in front of our ethics committee. We cannot solve every problem. Here's the problem. We're trained very often, certainly in medicine, as scientists. We are goal-directed. You come to the physician with high blood pressure, it's 180 over 100, the physician has got a goal to get your blood pressure below 140 over 90. So we give a treatment, the treatment hits the goal, we're happy, we're goal orientated. You come in with a pneumonia, the physician prescribes an antibiotic, you get better. We are trained as goal directed therapists with the type of patient who, who comes towards the end of life, we can't be goal-directed, because goal-directed is to die. So we have to change it from being a solution to this problem, a binary, we give this drug, we, give, we get this result, to becoming more about what's the best journey we can take this person on. And there's no solution. There was no solution in Charlie Gard's case. I don't believe going to court is a solution. In the UK, with its adversarial law system, there will, of necessity, be winners and losers. And the child's in the middle. So that's an awful situation. I was involved in a case in Belfast about 25 years ago where an eight-year-old, out with his dad, estranged from his mum, 
Mum lived in the south of Ireland, so there's jurisdiction issues about who had parental responsibility for the child. And the child actually got kicked in the side of the head by the horse's hoof and came in, became brainstem dead. So we met the criteria for brainstem death. The father refused to let me switch off the ventilator. Now, this was a clear cut. This wasn't an argument about a gray area. Will this baby with a rare mitochondrial disorder who might benefit from drug A or drug B? This was a definite, this child has achieved brain stem death criteria. Father refused to let, physically refused to let me switch off the ventilator. Mother not only wanted him to be switched off the ventilator, but she wanted his organs to be donated. But the child hadn't lived with her for a number of years. We couldn't resolve it. We spent many hours arguing philosophy with this father and arguing all sorts of things, and he would not come halfway to meet me. We went to court. Two days into court, the court wanted more data on his brainstem by doctors outside Northern Ireland because we were all biased. We all had conflict of interest. On day three, he came in to me in the morning and said, switch him off, Bob. And I said, I can't because it's in court and I would be in contempt of court if I switched off the ventilator at this stage. So we then applied to court to have it withdrawn. So I know from bitter experience, courts are not there to resolve these problems. In fact, the judges don't seem to want to have these cases. They bump them between the courts as well. So we have to find a resolution. We have to maintain the communication. We have to try and find how to resolve the immovable object against the unstoppable force. Good luck out there.